Good afternoon, Lea. Good afternoon, world. We are starting the next uh, seminar. And today, uh, at least uh, judging from the title, things are about to get a bit criminal. Uh, some killing is being advertised. Let's let's see how we how we do uh, with this. Uh, we have we have asked today uh, Carl Sachs, uh, an American uh, philosopher um, who works at the uh, Mary uh, Marymount University, uh, and Carl is speaking to us from um, yeah from where you are in the U.S. Yes, uh, from the country far away. So uh, so most of the event today is uh, is online. Welcome. Uh, and the floor is yours. Come on, please. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, <clears throat> so what I've prepared for us today is a presentation about an American philosopher named Wilfred Sellers. Um, Sellers, um, I think it's fair to say, is, is slowly getting some recognition. Uh, his recognition today is predominantly through philosophers that he influenced. Uh, in particular, I think uh, Robert Brandom and John McDowell are among his most well-known, um, not followers, obviously, but people who he influenced. I think are they're quite well-known, and so there's a slowly gathering interest in Sutter's uh, himself. And there's been a a, a growing interest in what Sellers called the myth of the given, a growing interest in Sellers' relationship to how he thought about philosophy and science as, in some complicated ways, answerable to each other. And so what I've prepared for us today is a slideshow about a particular aspect of Sellers' ideas, um, um, the what he, one idea of his called the myth of the given, and another idea of his that he refers to as the myth of Jones. And what I'm going to do is suggest a particular interpretation of the myth of the given and of the myth of Go and the myth of Jones. And let's see here. I just needed to start my slideshow from the beginning. Okay, and here we go. So in his uh, fairly well-known text, Empiricism and the Philosophy of Mind, EPM, um, Sellers begins that text by announcing he is going to take aim against what he calls the entire framework of givenness, which he says has been a persistent problem in history of philosophy, um, including uh, Kant and Hegel. Now, what he means by the, the given um, has often been frustrating to interpreters. Um, Sellers is a very subtle, very dialectical thinker and writer. And so the full meaning of his texts only becomes clear, if it becomes clear at all, after you've read a lot of them many times. Now, in the concluding section of his uh, his text, um, Sellers introduces a, another myth, what he calls the myth of Jones, which I'll explain uh, in a minute. And he tells us that he's using the myth of Jones to kill a myth. And I think this poses some nice interpretive questions. What does this mean? In what sense does the myth of Jones kill the myth of given? And how do we understand that? And so one of the main points I'd like to um, articulate in my in seminar today is that the standard reading with of Jones, which I'm going to go into in a minute, um, does not fit easily with some very recent and exciting interpretive work on the myth of the given. And so I want to suggest a new reading of the myth of Jones that I think makes better sense of how the myth of Jones is supposed to kill the myth of the given. And what I think Sellers is pointing towards is what I want to call a scientific 
metaphilosophy. That's to say, Sellers is, in my view, pointing the way towards a way of thinking about what philosophy itself is, which is informed by recent developments in the natural and social sciences. Um, and so what I want to do then is interpret the myth of Jones as uh, an allegory for the rise of a scientific metaphilosophy, which is say a view about what we were doing as philosophers based on what we think modern science is doing. And in particular, I want to focus co on cognitive science uh, because cognitive science um, poses very interesting challenges to what we think we are doing when we think, well, actually, let me rephrase that. Kind of science poses some nice challenges to what we think we are doing when we are thinking at all. And uh, these are challenges that are some have become somewhat better known due to philosophers who Sellers influenced, uh, in particular, the eliminative materialism of the early Rorty and, of course, the Churchlands, uh, debates about what folk psychology is, and if so, folk psychology explains anything, or if folk psychology is something to be simply dismissed in light of better neuroscience. Um, I mean, that is not Sellers' own view, but Sellers was very attentive to the ways in which the rise of cognitive psychology and cognitive science, um, or in his, in her, in his terms, um, cybernetics and behaviorism and neuroscience, how those sciences are challenging our conception of what we think we are doing when we are thinking. And accordingly, challenge our conception of what we're doing when we do philosophy. I think that is very important to what Sellers' overarching project. So what I do now is go into what I might come calling the standard reading in Myth of Jones. So in the his in his text, um, Empiricism and the Philosophy of Mind, Sellers asks us to imagine a group of people who lack the concepts of thought and sensation. So although they have concepts and sensations, and so in a sense they do have minds, they don't have the concept of mental states. And without that concept of mental states, they are not able to recognize themselves as having mental states, although Sellers assumes they do in fact have them. And in this imaginary community, uh, he calls these people the Rileyans, after um, the logical behaviorist Gilbert Ryle. Sellers imagines a solitary genius named Jones, because Sellers is an American philosopher writing in the 20th century, and everyone is named Smith or Jones. And in our, our genius Jones, um, realizes that certain regularities and irregularities in people's overt behavior could be explained if there's something going on inside of them which is analogous to overt speech episodes, in the case of thoughts, or analogous to uh, perceptions, in the case of sensations. They have these inner states analogous to sentences and takings. And so with Jones then, in a way, takes, tells us how to bake an introspectionist cake from a behaviorist ingredients, right? It tells us, here's how a story about how given a purely behavioristic community, a community where no mental states are allowed, someone comes up to invent the idea of mental states through analogy in order to explain people's behavior. 
this is a fairly standard reading of Myth of Jones. And what I suggest now is that myth, this standard reading, although nothing entirely mistaken, has problems, particularly in light of trying to think about, okay, how would this myth of Jones really kill the myth of the given? Now, the standard reading assumes a particular reading of the uh, myth of the given. Um, it assumes that the myth of the given is simply a claim about the immediacy or givenness of our mental states. Right? It assumes myth of the given is the idea that the immediate awareness of our mental states shows that our awareness of mental states is without further assumptions. It's presuppositionless. And Mother Jones then kills this myth by showing that our awareness of mental states can be one of non-inferential responsiveness, right? We can know our mental states without having to go through a process of logical inference. We can be, as it were, directly aware of them. And yet we are directly aware of them because we have acquired the concept of mental states. And we learn how to use that concept, pardon me. We learn how to use the conceptual, the conceptual framework of mental states in the same way we learn to use the conceptual framework of say, reporting on what colors are when we see things. Now this is um, an interesting reading of the myth of Jones and the myth of the given. But I want to suggest now that more recent work on the myth of the given complicates the story significantly and accordingly complicates the story about what the myth of the Jones needs to be. So here is a recent article by Michael Hicks. Um, he claims that the myth, the target of EPM, Empiricism of the Philosophy of Mind, is the assumption that some category of thought objects, sense data, let's say dry goods, whatever, has some sort of absolute authenticity. So the philosopher can only, need only pay respect to it and cannot expect empirical developments to ever overthrow it. To reject myth of the given, Hicks argues, is to reject the idea of a home base for semantic content. The problem with the given is the assumption of unrevisably authentic presence to mind, not, Hicks claims, the connection of that to empirical knowledge. So in Hicks's view, the problem with the given is not the immediate awareness of mental state specifically, the problem with the given is the assumption that any semantic content has a privileged, unrevisable status that would be untouched by any change in the rest of our evolving conceptual framework. And I think Hicks is exactly right about this. And I think it echoes other recent statements. Here's Jim O'Shea in 2021 is an article from uh, Synthes, What is the Myth of the Given? Um, here, O'Shea writes, what Sellers' dialectical conception of the myth of the categorical given attempted to show, the myth of the categorical given being a term O'Shea introduces, um, was that just about every classic philosophical position has rested on background starting points simply regarded as innocent because of a lack of awareness and alternative conception that reveals the innocence to have, in fact, been lost from the start. So this is O'Shea very much echoing Hicks's point, the poem of the myth of the given, is that every philosophical position rests on assumptions that are taken as innocent, when in fact, they are not. Um, Finally, uh, building on another statement from uh, Griffin Klemek, um, I believe I misspelled his name on the slide, it should be two M's. Um, he writes, 
I do wish that instead of the myth of the categorical given, which is O'Shea's term, um, the, the phrase, the myth of the directly classified given had caught on in the literature. Direct classification, or the idea of the simple awareness of something which is in fact of such and such a kind or sort by itself, provides when the direct awareness of X as being of that kind or sort. Is the, which is a quote from O'Shea, is the essence of the givenness that Sellers attacks as mythical. Right. This is to say that the myth of the given, in this sense, is the idea that in order to know how to classify something as a person, as an object, as a relation, as an event, um, as a process, to classify something, all you need uh, under a category, all you need is to simply be aware of that thing. And the awareness of that thing just tells you magically how to classify it with no further work involved. And that um, in, in, uh, assigns powers to the cognitive faculties that are, um, are simply magical and hence the, or and not compatible with a scientific understanding of how the mind might work. Finally, then a recent article by Salas. Um, uh, here, Salas is comparing the given with um, what Daniel Hutto and Eric Mayan call the hard problem of content. Their argument there that um, simple covariation between two different um, elements is not enough to constitute semantic content. And Salas builds on this and connects it to Sellers and says, taking a covariance relation as determining content would be like taking a natural mechanism to automatically select a unique given categorical choice or option of which subjects can be directly aware. Thus the very idea of information as covariance as determining semantic content falls prey to the categorical myth of the given, right? So covariance in a sense, right? Um, a good example, a simple example of covariance would be say, um, how a thermometer measures temperature or the relationship between tree rings and past sea, um, amounts of uh, precipitation. There's a covariation between those things. One varies as the other, as the other one does, but that is not determining semantic content in the sense that actually matters for philosophy of mind, epistemology, language, cognition, and, and so on. So, and this is a point that Hutto and Mayan make in their work, um, trying to expose some of the underlying assumptions in, uh, in mainstream cognitive science. So what these recent works um, show us is that the myth of the given is quite complicated. And so now I want to sort of bring, use that to now pose an interpretive puzzle. Right. How is this, if, if Sellers' fable, the myth, myth of Jones, is simply about the emergence of introspectionist psychology from behavioristic psychology, which is the standard reading, how is that? supposed to refute, undermine the idea that covariance considers content, which how Salos takes, how Salos takes the given, or that the category of thought object, any category of thought objects has absolute authenticity, as Hicks puts it, or the conflation of acquaintance and aboutness, as Klimek uh, rightly puts it. What I want to suggest now is that this new work on the myth of the given is taking with the given not so much to be about the privileged uh, introspection uh, of mental states, but rather something more about the, the, um, the immediacy and unrevisability of semantic content. It's not about psych, not just about philosophy of mind, although it is that, but it's also about philosophy of mind in the sense of 
not just like, okay, are, how are we aware of our mental states, but what is it to be cognizant of anything? What is the very nature of semantic content? And if you take the myth of the given to be about content, then I think that poses, uh, sharpens the question of how the myth of Jones might possibly kill the myth of the given. Um, I think there's a question in the chat. Uh, do you want to do want to address that now? Uh, as you prefer, we uh, we can uh, we can uh, first listen to your presentation and then have have a discussion, or uh, if 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 you prefer, no, do it afterwards, Carl. Do it afterwards. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. So what I suggest now is, um, what we now need to do is understand that if Myth of the Given is a story about the immediacy and unrevisability of semantic content, then the only thing that could kill it would be a story that would be um, a story about how semantic content is mediated and specifically how it is causally mediated, right? That's what it would take to kill the Myth of the Given. And then, so the next, and that I eventually wanna argue is that that is exactly what the myth of Jones properly understood actually is. So what I do now then is turn to um, this passage from uh, Sutter's text, Philosophy and the Scientific Image of Man, um, published, uh, written, I think a few years after EPM, but published along with it in his text, uh, Science, Perception and Reality. And here he argues that on one hand, the transition from preconceptual patterns of behavior to conceptual thinking was in one sense, a holistic jump, a jump to a new level of awareness that's irreducibly new. That the emergence of conceptual thinking is the emergence of the kind of being that a human being is. And Sutter says, this is a, there's, a, there's a level of truth to this, but he also wants to say that this jump needs to be understood as also a gradual transition, right? Uh, the difference in level between preconceptual pre patterns of behavior and conceptual thinking which appears in the manifest image as an irreducible, as an irreducible discontinuity. We have a lot of philosophy, uh, tremendous, the entire philosophical tradition from Aristotle to Hegel speaks in favor of the idea that there is some fundamental irreducible discontinuity between animal behavior and human conceptual thinking. And yet at the same time, Sutter says, in the scientific image, the scientific image, of the scientific picture of what the mind is, this is also a reducible difference, a matter of degree, not of kind. And the question for Sellers is how to reconcile these two pictures of a difference in kind and a difference in degree. There does seem to be some sort of qualitative and all difference between purposive animal responsiveness and discursively articulable thought. And, but this can't be magic, right? There have to be empirically detectable causal mechanisms which underpin this transition in both human development and in evolution. Denying the first claim leads to a very reductive flat ball naturalism um, of the sort perhaps uh, historic associated with Quine and perhaps the Churchlands. Um, but denying two um, leads to a kind of supernaturalism that Sellers um, refers to as the last vestige of special creation. So we need a scientific image of mind. We need and if, if we think of mindedness as including a kind of cognition or thought, and if some explanations trade the descriptions and explanations of causal mechanisms, that's what science gives us, 
then a science of mind, a scientific image of mind, would describe and explain the causal mechanisms that underpin cognition. Um, in retrospect, I think I should have added not just cognition, but also consciousness. Um, although I have much less to say about consciousness, I find consciousness very, very weird, and I don't know what to say about it. So let's talk about cognition, because I feel like I kind of understand that. Um, so a scientific image of mind then would, in, if, in order to give us, in, order to, in, the, in the process of giving us um, uh, descriptions, explanations of the causal mechanism of underpin cognition, what we would have to get then is a theory of semantic contents, the contents of our thoughts, attitudes, beliefs, desires, and so on, as causally efficacious, as integrated into the causal picture of the world that science gives us. And that, I think, is one way of understanding the project of cognitive science. What I want to do now, then, is turn to the idea of cognitive neuroscience as offering us a theory of representations as causally efficacious. Now, this is the idea that there are such representations is somewhat controversial. Um, and I think we have some people online who might be want to push back against this idea. So happy to get into that during the Q&A. For the time being, I'm simply going to rely on a kind of mainstream kind of humdrum ordinary picture of cognitive neuroscience. You may call mainstream cognitive neuroscience um, because I think that is the kind of picture that Sellers needs for his story. Um, because he does need a theory of semantic contents as causally efficacious. Without that, it's not so clear what a science of mind would even be by his standards. Now, there are two main contenders within mainstream cognitive kind of neuroscience about this uh, today. Um, there are others, but the two ones I want to particularly pay attention to are um, theories of structural representations and theories of informational teleosemantics. And although these views can be combined and arguably should be combined, they are nevertheless distinct. Right? I take structural representations to be the idea that representations represent by virtue of standing in causally asymmetric, structurally homomorphic relationships with their targets. Right, so representation counts as um, a state of the cognitive system counts as a representation if there is some um, target, some feature of the environment or feature of the body, some representational target. And there is something about the structure of that state, which is structurally homomorphic. So there's a mapping relationship and where that, uh, not necessarily isomorphic, but homomorphic, um, isomorphism being a very strong criterion that's hard to satisfy. Um, and also where this mapping is causally asymmetric, right? It's the case that the content is brought into being in order to match the target, not that um, the target is brought into being in order to match the content. Now, there have been critics of this, there are criticisms of this view, and some people think it's sort of not, it's, there are problems with this view that we can um, certainly need to be discussed. And because there are problems with this view, some people have tried to supplement it or combine it with a the theory of informational telesemantics, the idea that representations um, work by reliably conveying information about the status of their targets. Um, and I want to, and I'm picking up information on TLS semantics, um, the version developed by Karen Neander in particular, um, because I think it has certain advantages over other versions of TLS semantics developed by other philosophers uh, of, cogn of cognition. Now, I want to turn now to uh, a recent text by a philosopher of neuroscience named Gualtiero Piccinini, because Piccinini. Um, 
Whitman has a sort of interesting text where he is leaning upon structural, structural presentations and informational tale of semantics in order to tell a story about what brains are doing, right? And he calls this theory, the theory of situated neural representations, where he wants to say a neural structural representation is a simulation of a target, where the simulation is a state of is a system of states, morphic, which can evolve to match the evolution of the target to some degree of approximation. And we might say, what degree is that? And I think the answer would be whatever degree of approximation is needed for behavioral success. And a neural structural presentation is then a system which functions to include, to build and maintain a simulation of the body and its environment, to use simulation to guide behavior by issuing motor commands to the uh, musculature, and then to use information to uh, update its simulations. A, simulation, a, a system that can do all this has neural structural representations. And these are embodied and embedded, right? So one thing that Piccinini is doing is trying to uh, build a bridge between representational theories of mind and anti-representational anti um, inactive theories of cognition, right? Piccinini wants to say, no, no, no representations must be embodied and embedded. Right, it must be the neurocognitive system has to be embodied, embedded, inactive, and affective. This situatedness is necessary because representations are going to be are interdependent with the rest of the body environment system, which was there emerging diachronically through this constant dynamical interaction. Right, so. For on Piccinini's view, to talk, talk, talk about representations is not talk about representations as disembodied or as, uh, as part of a self-enclosed system, right? There's, on Piccinini's view, there's no room for the kind of methodological solipsism that Fodor developed, um, right? Piccinini is going to say that representations function as representations by virtue of being embodied and embedded in the right ways. Because it's precisely that embodiment and embeddedness that confers causal efficacy onto semantic contents. And that's what we need in order to really defeat the myth of the given. Um, another way of putting the same point would say that one of the reasons why the myth of the given can take semantic contents as unrevisable and absolute is because the myth of the given does not treat semantic contents as causally efficacious, right? If you, if you don't think of semantic contents as embedded in the causal nexus to begin with, it's very tempting to think, well, they're they, it doesn't really matter how we revise our beliefs, attitudes, assumptions, um, our ongoing bodily interactions with the world, our evolution and development, none of that really matters, none of that affects, can touch semantic content because semantic content is um, a different kind of thing. It's not causally, it's isolated, uh, insulated maybe, from the rest of the, the causal order. Um, and kind of science um, gives us a way of dislodging that longstanding philosophical commitment because it gives us a picture of cement of semantic contents or representations as causally efficacious. And hence they can't be given in the kind of problematic way that Sellers was arguing against. So now we need to think a bit more about what representations are. Now, and here I want to defend a kind of fairly modest uh, functionalism. Um, functionalism is a dirty word in some parts, but hopefully um, not with us. I want to talk about uh, 
privileging, first of all, biological functions. Uh, there are several accounts of biological functions. The most, uh, most well-known version of biological functions is the etiological or selectionist account where functions are simply um, the result of past selective history. This is the version of function that has become very important in most teleosemantics. This is the version of biological function that Millikan um, developed and that Neander also uh, defends. But there is an alternative, which I think is actually much more interesting. Um, this is a kind of goal contribution account of functions where functions are whatever accounts to present organismal purposes. And this is actually something I find very intriguing because it's at this point where we could make some provocative, interesting bridges to the account of biological agency that is being developed by philosophers such as um, Mosiero, uh, Mos, uh, right, Mosio, Moreno, uh, Leonardo Biche, um, Mon uh, Monteville. Um, there are similar developments happening in theories of biological agency in some parts, in pe some people who are rethinking the foundations of evolutionary theory, uh, Dennis Walsh, for example, at Toronto. So there's an interesting movement happening where philosophers are really thinking about what it is to be an organism or to be a biological agent at all. And I think this account of biological agency gives us an interesting, very helpful way of thinking about biological functions, which can also then be used to reframe the entire project of teleosemantics. And one reason I think why I think two is interesting is because it can account for the causal efficacy of semantic contents in the here and now better than etiological accounts can. Um, and I can reference some literature making this argument, which I think is very provocative and very interesting, um, which I'm trying to build upon in my own, my current research. One thing that's, one thing that is sort of, and I, I wanted to mention that just because, you know, when I talk about Taylor semantics, people often think I'm talking about um, selectionist accounts of function. And I want to put that slide up there just to indicate not necessarily, right? We can think about teleosemantics in terms of biological agency, not just in terms of past selective effects. Now, one thing this does, and I think that's an interesting uh, implication of the kind of view I'm developing, is that on this kind of view of embodied, embedded neural, represent neural representations, there are going to be many different kinds of minds, right? It says that there could be, there could be causally efficacious semantic contents wherever an animal can coordinate its behavior in response to a diverse stimuli. Now, we might even want to push the envelope a little bit more and say, well, what about plants? What about fungi? What about bacteria? And we can, but for the time being, I just at least want to talk about, at least about other animals. We could talk about bacteria if you want, they're fascinating. But at this point, I'm just trying to only just try to talk about animals for the time being. Um, and this is going to say that, but and if this is the standard then of what counts as having a mind, that's going to include at least almost all of the complex metazoan animals. It's gonna include not just charismatic vertebrates like, you know, people and dolphins and whales or whatever, it's going to include worms. It's going to include the arthropods, which are your insects and arachnids and crustaceans. It's going to include maybe not all mollusks, but certainly our friends, the cephalopods, the octopus and squids. It does include the cordates, which is the group that uh, vertebrates such as us belong to. Um, and so here I want to pick up on a, um, this recent text by Ginsberg and Jablonka, their book, The Evolution of the Sensitive Soul, where they argue that what really matters is the kind of learning an animal can go through. And they, class, and they make a distinction between what they call limited associative learning and unlimited associative learning. 
where um, limited associative learning is where an animal can simply associate um, a stimulus and a response within a particular sensory modality. So like seeing one color, you, see, you associate one color with a color or associate a sound with a sound. Whereas unlimited associative learning is multimodal. An animal can associate a sound with a smell or can associate a um, behavior, something seen with um, a flight path to where to go. So for example, even the, the, the well-known case of honeybees, which are able to communicate the location and distance of flowers to each other, that is actually a fairly complicated cognitive task. And that would be an instance of an unlimited associative learning. In fact, uh, under controlled conditions, um, honey uh, bees are able to actually uh, show pretty complicated um, behavioral learning, right? They can associate, you know, um, different uh, colors and patches and smells and decisions in ways that um, are really quite um, sophisticated. And so any animal that can have this kind of behavior would have causally efficacious semantic contents, would have a mind. Maybe not a very impressive one, a minimal mind, but still have a mind in the scientific sense. Now, kind of neuroscience alone would not satisfy the Solarzian philosopher because the Solarsian philosopher is going to want, not, want to know not, about, not just about bees, but about humans. Um, she's going to want a natural explanation of the kind of semantic contents that we have, which are expressible in a public language share, governed by shared norms. And figuring that out will require not just cognitive neuroscience, but also evolution, history, linguistics, thinking about culture, institutions, commerce, political structures. It would have to be a, a Naturwissenschaft des Geistes, a sort of natural scientific theory of spirit. And that is a very tall order. That's extremely ambitious. And I think that's exactly what Sellers had in mind. Because he writes at the very end of EPM, I've used a myth to kill a myth, the myth of the given. But is my myth really a myth? Or does the reader not recognize in Jones himself, the Jones as man with a capital M himself, in the middle of his journey from the groans and grunts of the cave to the subtle and polydimensional discourse of the drawing room, the laboratory and the study, the language of Henry and William James, of Einstein and the philosophers who and their efforts to break out of discourse to an archaic beyond all discourse provide the most curious dimension of all. This gives us a picture of what is the of philosophy. Discourse is polydimensional. Our human discourse involves dimensions such as mathematics, science, art, music, logic, and so on. It's a historical, it begins with the grunts and groans of the cave which we don't need to take literally, but simply as standing in for Pleistocene hominid pre-linguistic communication. Philosophers have attempted to break this, have attempted to break out of discourse to a archaic, an origin, a foundation that goes beyond all discourse. But this is only one dimension among others. And so now we can finally understand what I think all this is leading up to. The search for an RK beyond all discourse is ultimately, by Sotos' light, going to be a pre-scientific way of thinking about what philosophy is and about what we're doing as philosophers. It is this search for the lever of Archimedes that makes the given seem so compelling in our philosophical literature, war, whereas the myth of Jones is an allegory for a historical naturalistic account of what we're doing as philosophers in tandem with cognitive science, once we recognize that it is necessary to think of semantic contents as integrated into the causal order. In short, we are looking for a scientific metaphilosophy 
a natural social science of spirit. Um, that is a conception of what we're doing as philosophers that has been suitably revised in light of what cognitive neuroscience is telling us about what thought itself really is. So thank you. And um, I'm, hoping, I'm look, looking forward to uh, questions. So I'm going to stop the share now. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I suggest that we uh, turn the cameras on so we can see each other. It will be nicer for, for having a conversation. Uh, uh, and uh, and yeah, we, we have quite a lot of time. It's uh, over one hour left. So so I suggest we start with maybe the chat questions or comments that were already already there, uh, yeah. both from Ralph Banelli. Ralph, would you would you like to uh, uh, ask those questions? Okay. So I see the questions from Ralph. Hello, nice to see your face. Um, so hi, Ralph. hi. Um, so uh, my question. Ralph? Well, my question was really I've recently been reading Hato and Mian. Um, so I'm sorry if I say something that's a little bit off what your focus was, because you seem to be worried about how semantic content gets going. Yeah, whereas Hato and Mian, of course, are interested in, um, what they call basic minds, which are minds without semantic content. So I wonder, yeah, I read Sellers a long time ago, but I wonder whether what he calls the given or the myth of the given would include what Hato and Mian are calling um, non-semantic um, um, states of mind, if you like, yeah? Um, and, um, how they might generate semantic states of mind by engaging with social practices which already have semantic content. I wonder whether Sellers' myth of the given could be attacked from that point of view, attacked in the sense that, you know, obviously he was thinking about semantic content i would imagine yeah when he wrote when he wrote his book when he developed his critique but if you take semantic content out of it maybe there is a given there but it's not a semantic given i'm sorry if that's a bit confused but um no i don't think it's confused at all i think it's a nice question um I mean, I think that, I think, I think Hatu and Mayan are, I don't, I mean, they don't really reference Sellers too, too much, but they're, they're Wittgensteinians, they are aware of these kinds of problems. Um, I think that they are attentive to the myth of the given, in, in my sense, and they are definitely trying to avoid it. I think part of their critique of, cognitive, of, of mainstream cognitive science could be rephrased as mainstream cognitive science falls prey to myth of the given by simply taking semantic contents as, well, it's just obvious that there are them, that they're, they're, they're there and we need to explain them. So I, th I think Hutto and Mayan are allies to Sellers up to that particular point. Um, I think that myth of the given and what they call the hard problem of content are very similar, if not identical, problems. Um, is the myth of the given in what they are doing? I mean, it's always a nice question to ask, but to be honest, I, if there's any whiff of givenness in their project, it only lies in how thinly specified they are, how thin the sketch is as to how uh, social practices bring content into being. And, and that, that, now they do address this. They have a nice paper, um, uh, what's it called? It's a, it's, a it's a revisiting um, Hoagland's old intentionality all-stars uh, paper. 
I forget what it's called. Um, it's a paper of theirs from a couple of years ago where they sort of have a story about how to think about semantic content as building on different aspects of um, how to get from covariance to content. Um, I think that's, they, and they need something like that. And I think that this particular point, the problem that they have is simply that their account is, is pretty thin. Um, they would need something a bit more complicated. And I personally suspect that we're going to need um, so a more demanding account of what's going on um, at the level of cognition. I think one of the things I personally would want to say is that there is a nice distinction to be drawn between basic minds. At, they're, they're onto something, right? They're onto something. But there's a distinction that they're making that's interesting, right? And I'm not against their view at all. Um, but in order to get away from attributing to basic minds the same kinds of semantic content that we have, they end up getting rid of semantic content entirely, hence basic minds. And I think that might be a little bit of a problem. Um, now, it is other question that you raised, um, Get rid of content entirely. Somebody talk about biological functions, relevant causal mechanisms, um, and get rid of that entirely. Um, yeah. I mean, part, part, Carl, Carl, part of this was if, if you, you think could, about, but why would you want to? <laughs> well, if you think about biological functions or what you called Kantian functionalism as well, it's a bit mm -hmm. like the Aristotelian, Aristotelian final cause, isn't it? It's something which looks at what happens in the end, it's a teleological explanation. And that seems to me leaves out causal mechanisms. So presumably you need to, you need to add to a kind of Kantian functionalism or even to a biological functionalism. Um, you need to add causal mechanisms. Otherwise you've just got co-correlation. You haven't got causality, haven't you? Well, that's certainly right. Um, that's certainly right. But I don't see I, I don't see a tension between talking about contents and talking about mechanisms. Um, I see talking about content as specifying a particular kind of uh, how to put it. Talking about semantic contents is going to be. Um, in the final analysis, talking about a particular kind of mechanistic explanation. Name it's gonna be the kind of mechanistic explanation that you're going to involve when you're trying to talk about how, is, how a uh, biological agent is able to modulate and guide its behavior in response to um, features of its environment that are not perceptually present. Right. So, yeah, so, so we don't, we don't, we don't necessarily have to talk about representations for, uh, for all cognition, right? There might be extremely simple cognitive systems that are, as it were, entirely online systems, right? So, like maybe very simple nematodes might count as entirely online systems or jellyfish might be entirely online systems. So maybe jellyfish have no representations. But when you don't you talk, once you get to the level of organisms like um, octopuses or honeybees or any animal that has some kind of capacity to um, guide and modulate its behavior in response to um, potential affordances, then you have to be talking about representations in this very, very minimal naturalistic, uh, naturalistic sense that you find, I think, in people like uh, Neander and Nicholas Shea, um, uh, Piccinini and other people. 
Now, that representation is in that, in that very modest sense might not be doing all the work that we want semantic content to do. Right. So representations in this kind of sense might not be the kind of thing that will solve problems in philosophy of language or epistemology. Probably certainly wouldn't. But it would simply be the naturalistic beginning of an account that, you know, sort of, we might sort of think, well, like, we, on the one hand, we have very simple organisms like honeybees or, um, you know, very simple minds. On the other hand, we have um, very complex minds, minds like ours, that in, can engage in symbolic communication governed by social norms. We have kind of minds described by Wittgenstein or Brandom. Um, and the need to evolve minds like that has been has certainly shaped the past six million years of human evolution in ways that are still being dissected and analyzed by uh, anthropologists and paleontologists. So you have to have some sort of story that tells you how to get from one to the other, but a story that did that would also be a story that changes in quite radical ways what we think we are doing as philosophers, because now we would see that the search for an RK beyond our discourse is simply not possible for minds like ours. So it's going to involve a change in what we think we're doing as philosophers. It's going to be, I think, a fairly radical break with the dominant voices in the Western tradition. Thank you very much. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, hello. I have a question. It's not really a, I'm not sure if it's really a question, but I was just fascinated by this moment when you were speaking before, when you, when you were searching for your words. There was a moment when you were replying and you, you said, how shall I, how shall I put it? Hmm. And I find that so interesting that you knew what you wanted to say, but you didn't know what you wanted to say. Mm. Like you knew what you wanted to say, but you didn't know what the word was. And it seemed like a perfect illustration of what you're saying. Because you didn't yet have the category to say the, or the word to say the thing that you wanted to say, and yet you still knew what it was that you wanted to say. But do you mean that as a representation, that the words would be representational? Both, both might be actually on different levels. I'm not really sure. I just, it just seemed like so poignant and poetic that moment uh -huh. that I'm not really sure what it means. But it's uh -huh. something very interesting that we can. How shall I put it? Yeah. <laughs> But those, those those moments reveal uh, uh, like what what is thought made of that it's not word yes because exactly. because you have those moments exactly mm -hmm. exactly yeah. so what is it that's in your mind in that moment when you know what it is but you don't know what it is I think that is what we call intuition. Yeah, I think you've put your finger on a very interesting moment. Um, I appreciate that attentiveness. Um, I mean, I think when I, sometimes when I when I have those moments, um, and I have them a lot, you know, when I'm teaching and, you know, giving talks, sometimes it's a matter of gathering my thoughts and making sure I can articulate them. Sometimes it's a matter of trying to tailor what I'm trying to say to a particular audience, you know, taking into account audience expectations, taking into account what I don't know about what the audience knows. And I have to sort of take a moment to think about, okay, right, these people are not, they might not be experts in Wilfred Silvers, they might not be experts in cognitive science, right? I have to take a moment to modulate and choose my words based on um, what I don't know about what the audience might know. So, and I think that's, um, 
so like in that sense, so like in a way, like in that moment, I, I certainly had a sense of what I wanted to say. I had some pretty clear understanding about what I, what I was committed to philosophically, but then figuring out how to tailor that and modulate that in response to what I don't know about what the audience might or might not know then there's a moment of, okay, how do I put this? Marco? Yeah, hi there, thank you. Uh, hi Carl, nice to uh, finally uh, see you in person. Yeah, likewise. Um, Thank you for the talk. It's interesting. It's, it's been a while for me for philosophy, but um, maybe a bit naive question, but, but could you, uh, first of all, maybe elaborate a bit more, because I'm not super familiar with this uh, stuff, but I'm confused whether Celis's issue with the myth of the given is with the um, condition of what knowledge entails. For example, the sense data by themselves seem at least intrinsically knowledge about the sense data as such, sensation as primary. Um, does he even challenge that, or is it simply the challenging of the notion that the primary sense data are also knowledge about the external state of the world that causes sense data, right? Because uh, I'm not clear how that's, um, uh, where, where the issue exactly lies. Because then uh, I need to know that before I can understand how exact, what exactly you're pursuing in terms of cognitive or neuro, um, cognitive neuroscience explanations of the mind uh, and representations. Um, because I'm kind of confused how myth of Jones actually dispels with uh, the myth of the given. Because the tell me if I'm wrong, but the way it sounds like it's trying to argue that the only reason why there is a epistemic value to sensations is because of concepts able to systematize or validate them or put them into awareness. Sorry, a lot of random naive questions, but if you could help clarify that, that would be very uh, appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Um... So one of the questions you just posed was, okay, what's the Solarzian, what's the Solarzian problem with sense data? And you can think about this in two different ways. You can think about this as um, without the right kind of conceptual framework, you wouldn't be able to even recognize sense data as sense data versus maybe a story about using sense data to make inferences about the world that's causing them. I think Silders actually has the first view in mind. Um, Silders thinks that even being able to recognize sense data as sense data is itself the result of a complex learning process that involves a tremendous amount of knowing how, as well as knowing that. Um, so, one of the things that Seller sort of does in, in his uh, text, Empiricism of the Philosophy of Mind, is argue that when you think about how we even acquire the concept of sense data, you will see that sense data cannot be inferentially isolated from the rest of our concepts. Um. I get that, but but then I have a big issue. So so if the if it's about the how, then there's very two very important distinctions of how, right? So how could be how as a simulation. So if you have an embodied or implicit uh, procedural whatever model of how something arises in terms of the causes, you can do that without content, right? So for example, naive physics would be a story of how without the concept of physics. And mm -hmm. so uh, uh, how how would sellers, for example, deal with that? Because it seems that the necessity or the uh, dependence on concepts rests on this interpretation of how that how has to be a contentful explanation or conceptual explanation when it can also be non-conceptual. Well, because mm. just. Had yeah. Because the loop starts it's just a loop because uh, we've had a few exchanges a few years ago uh, on Twitter, um, both anonymously and non-anonymously. Um uh an active inference. So so you might remember me as a big active inference, Dan. So so, mm -hmm. so one of the, the implications of that and related corners is basically that recognition and inferring the causes is basically the same thing. 
So we infer things in terms of the underlying causes or the generative sources, uh, generative causes of the data that arrives. Um, because that attribution is effectively what allows it to connect to the things, uh, the other concept, the other knowledge, the other models uh, mm -hmm. in terms of which you recognize it by. So that becomes a recognition model. Um, and so the, the conjunction of recognition and the inference of causes, conceptually or non-conceptually, seems to kind of dissolve this tension, uh, if that makes sense. Because you talked a bit about situation, situated no representations, and 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 this is one of the perspectives as well in that kind of core like situated simulation or embodied simulation, etc. So active inference and emulation theory and similar account accounts that are sort of in that same ballpark, the same general air vicinity. Those are all the kind of account that would dissolve the method to give it on a reading of the method to give it. Um, and because the myth is given is going to, because the myth is given involves this idea that we can take any aspect of our experience, whether it's sense data or physical objects or anything as sort of inferentially and causally isolated from the rest of our evolving embodied experience. Or isolated so, or presuppositionless? Is that is there a primacy between the two? Um, that's a nice question. I guess maybe this might be a particular um, quirk of my reading. Um, mm -hmm. I think that we end up taking we end up treating them as causally and inferentially isolated because we are committed to thinking of them as without presuppositions. Mm. Interesting, because there's a loopiness, I think, that's relevant here. So, so I think presuppositionless seems to be kind of an intuitive way of saying that there's no epistemic grounding, right? There's no extra explanation from below. But at the same time, um, in, in a neurocognitive perspective, there's this loopiness or these evolutionary processes going on. So things don't persist, um, given that they're always under uh, uh, analogous notion of evolutionary pressure or selection pressure. Um, mm -hmm. if you take an inferential view. And so even uh, primary sense data that have no a priori cause explanation beyond the physical data that elicits them uh, would still be adjudicated by the value, the ability to inform other inferential processes within the larger context or ecosystem of the mind. So in that sense, the, the presupposition is kind of a post-supposition that uh, retroactively becomes a presupposition. So the, 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 the awareness of sense data seems to be justified by a post hoc presupposition of this can inform other inferential processes. Does that make sense? I think it does. But I also think it's important to distinguish between the pre-scientific views that we're inheriting from the, from the philosophical tradition and the more scientific views that we are trying to bring into conversation with them. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, a good example, um, I mean, one example, the kind of philosopher, I mean, in some respects, the last great philosopher in this pre-scientific tradition, um, and a philosopher I was actually very near and dear to my heart personally, was one of Sutter's teachers, a guy named uh, C.I. Lewis, <laughs> um, whose mind in the world order is a brilliant, brilliant um, articulation of a kind of Kantian pragmatism, but is entirely uh, methodologically isolated from all the sciences, like Lewis is just writing this text, I think it's what, 2019, 27, where he's basically saying like, let's just not worry about the sciences, let's put it all aside, let's just do straight transcendental philosophy, reflective analysis is what he calls it, <laughs> and ends up giving sense data a kind of privileged status in the course of doing that kind of armchair epistemology. Um, but when we look at sense data from a neurocognitive uh, perspective, whether that in terms of emulation theory or active inference um, or, you know, Pichinese stuff, right? We end up seeing, oh, well, actually it turns out that sense data can't really be um, 
given this kind of isolated privileged status because they're bound up with this vastly complicated causal machinery at the mm -hmm. subpersonal level that's generating sense data in response to how the mo how uh, your generative models are revised are being updated in light of um, anomalous perceptions or whatever your story might be. And you're saying there's convergence there in the pre-scientific accounts yeah. of, of Lewis and uh, the, the modern emerging scientific uh, frameworks. Yeah, and I think, but I think that is really what Sellers was really concerned with, right? He has this manifest image that he constructs from by you know drawing on Aristotle and Kant and Hegel, um, and I think C. I. Lewis. I think Lewis's version, of the manifest image, was actually an important influence on on Sellers personally. Um, Strawson's text, Individuals, is also a very interesting way of constructing a a manifest image, a description of manifest image, right? And Sellers has one foot in that tradition and in that world. Um, and he has one foot in the world of thinking about how the spirit of Aristotle is being reborn with Ryle and Austin and Strawson. That's one dimension of his work. He has another foot in the world of the emerging science of the mind as they're happening in the 1940s and 1950s, where he is aware of He's certainly aware of Tolman's work on cognitive maps. He's certainly aware of the cybernetics. He is certainly aware of recent work in neurophysiology. Um, he is informed by what was beginning to take place in the cognitive revolution. Um, you know, his has this very important text from 1960, being and being known. Um, and although he doesn't make it explicit, because he rarely does, um, <laughs> I think it's clear that he was at least, I think it's, I think it's tolerably clear that he had read and responding to um, Hillary Putnam's 1960 Minds and Machines. Mm -hmm. um, so he has one foot in that world as well, and he's trying to bring them together. And I think that the myth of the, so and that's sort of what's inspired my reading are the myth of the given as the story about mindedness that we had in pre-scientific philosophy and a story about what we're doing as philosophers as pre-scientific and then pointing out the need for a scientifically a scientific meta philosophy that takes into account what we're learning from cybernetics non-reductive behaviorism neurophysiology and then in our own day the cognitive science revolution, which has vastly ramified in all sorts of ways. Mm. And so this is actually one of the reasons why I want to sort of pick up Sellers as um, a really interesting philosopher of cognitive science. Because even though cognitive science is has far outstripped what it was in the 1940s and 50s when Sellers was writing, right? Nevertheless, I think he is offering us a really interesting framework in order to think about what cognitive science is doing and why we need it and its philosophical significance. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Yeah. I'll let someone else uh, <laughs> ask something. If I may, I have a question about uh, the other myth, myth the, the myth of Jones. So to parallel the, uh, the conversation because the, this one was, was into the first myth and we are, we are trying to see how one uh, annihilates the other. Uh, Listening to you uh, about uh, the, your description, this this myth of Jones, I, maybe I misunderstood, but listening to you and trying to imagine how I would believe this myth, it, I had a hard time because it was it was incredible, to, like it, it, difficult to, to to buy in, and and it's it's it, it may be that I just don't understand because what what I got is that. Uh, observing a phenomenon that responds in a complex way to complex stimuli. Uh, just because of the complexity I'm observing from like from the outside behaviorally, I would come to the conclusion that there must be a representation, like there must be someone, like another Jones inside of this, this machine because of that, yes, uh, because of the complexity of, of uh, so it's like you said, it's, uh, it's an inference from the behavioral observation from the outside. And I was trying like, 
how I would ever, you know, come up with the idea that there is a representation, that there is a mind in it, if I wasn't, uh, if I didn't have this experience of being a mind that actually like modulates it, uh, from, but, but then I'm back in the myth of the given, if I understand right, yes, that without the experience of being a subject, that the, the assumption or the suspicion that there might be another mind, I like I, I just cannot like imagine why would I invent this uh this interpretation and not just you know that that this phenomenon is like very sensitive to all sorts of stimuli that are coming and responding to them. Uh, so uh so is is in this myth of, of Jones uh like does it have this component of me taking already the given subjectivity of how it feels to be a subject and attributed attributing it to another mind or am i uh not getting it <laughs> no mata i think you're getting it exactly and i think this is a very nice question that um i think needs i think this actually this is a nice way of i think of, of i think you're raising a very interesting question here which is to say isn't the myth of the Jones, how can the myth of Jones be um, dissolving or killing the myth of the given when the myth of Jones in fact presupposes yeah. the, um, the given, so what the given says, what the presupposes that in fact, what is given is not really mythical at all. Um, so one thing I think is going on here is I think that there's, an, I don't know how much Sellers himself would be committed. I, I'm going to say something in my own voice. I have no idea of this. This is not a point about Sellers' exegesis. It's something that um, I'm speaking strictly in my own voice. I think that it's going to be true of myths in general. I don't want to post a general theory of myth. Thank goodness my friend Kate Coffey has, has left. She would kill me if I said this. <laughs> Um, she's a folklorist, among other things. Um, but I think it's going to be true of myths in general, or is the kind, or maybe you might say, not myths in general, but etiological myths. Right, etiological myths, myths about the origins of things. Um, that they have that moment of presupposing the very thing they're trying to explain. Um, and I think that's going to be a problem um, with ecological myths in general. And I think in a way, that's kind of what makes the myth of Jones precisely a myth is exactly the problem that you're identifying is, I mean, the sheer unbelievability of it that you're pointing out, the air of paradox to it is, I think, so why Sutter is going to say, yeah, and that's why it's not really true. That's why it's just an allegory for our capacity to revise our self-understanding over time as we learn more about the kinds of beings we are and about the kind and how about how the world is. So I, I have a quick question, uh, which is so you mentioned this sort of embodied, embedded neural representations right you could imagine that this somehow you know which is obvious everything is embodied everything is embedded it would be kind of silly to think otherwise but then how do you reconcile this kind of for lack of a better word uh, what you would call like right-wing seller seller uh, sellers style limited materialism of scientific meta philosophy which somehow gives up these causally efficacious representations with the fact that these representations that are nonetheless embodied and embedded come to us through language and history, and that the sellers of felt on the left wing side, you know, did think that to some extent that was irreducible, I think, to a scientific meta philosophy. So I'd like to see, I'd like to know, you know, the, the, you know, the representations, they're, they're not coming from our sense data for the most part, they're coming from our immersion. In language in the social community. Mm -hmm. So how how what why do you have to 
is that not the arche? Is that not the origin that you know you're kind of looking for? And what? How does this affect your whole story? Yeah, that's a nice question. I'm afraid I need to step off the step off the call for just one sec, but I'll be right back, and I'll think, and I'll I'll give you an answer at that time if that's okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. If anybody would like to say something unrelated, meanwhile, please <laughs> feel, feel, feel free. <laughs> the, the audience is fancy. <laughs> I'm curious, Herat, what do you think about those myths we are discussing? Okay. okay, sorry about that. So the question was about or part of it, how I might be trying to reconcile, how I might be thinking about the right wing Solarzian view and the left wing Solarzian view. Um, I mean, I think this sort of goes back to my response to uh, right to, to Marco, right? We fusing the images and fusing the left and right wing Solarzian stories. Um, is going to involve recognizing that although there is a sense in which symbolic communication and you know language games and assertions all that is in a sense logically irreducible to what we get in the scientific image but it is still causally reducible to it. And this idea that they are, you know, he uses this kind of uh, interesting language where he wants to say that they are, right, logically irreducible, but causally reducible. And there's been some question what exactly that means. Um, I take it that for sellers, logically irreducible, just means something like they're not synonymous. That they um, don't have the same meaning, but given a, uh, but then the cat, then that if you give, the, if you think about that in light of Sutter's so theory of meaning, where meaning is functional classification, what you really end up with is simply the claim that talk about our folk, our folk psychological states is governed by a different set of norms than talk about, say, our neurophysiological states. And I don't, and that's, that might seem like a, a sort of uninteresting, uh, almost trivial conclusion. Um, I mean, in a way, part of what I think Sellers ends up doing is he ends up saying that anti-psychologism is true, but it's an analytic truth. And that makes it true, but trivial, true, but almost trivial. Um, I have a whole thing about that. Um, so, but I also think that for Sellers, Sellers is not going to want to say that language and culture and art and symbolism, um, he's not going to want to say that those are immaterial. 
right? He has this very complicated story of what he calls, um, right, sign design. It's a very complicated story about how language pictures the world in which it is used. And I think this account of picturing is complicated and very weird, and a lot of people are against it entirely. But I think that he does need that account in order to tell a story about how um, language games get genuine causal traction with the world uh, precisely through the ways in which when we are engaged in linguistic communication, we are engaged in a process of um, encoding our are, are in, you know that there's a complicated story of how language is produced in the brain, how language is uh, in, interpreted in the brain, and yet some story along those lines about how the how the brain produces and interprets linguistic utterances is going to be necessary for a uh, a scientific view of language that allows us to fuse the images. So insofar as the left-wing Solarzians are going to say, well, we don't need that story. We don't need to worry about that. Um, I think that they are in a way retreating from Sellers and going back to Sellers own roots in Wittgenstein and other philosophers. And they're sort of retreating from Sellers. At the same time, I also think that the more right-wing Solarzians who are just not worrying about language and culture and tradition because they're so worried about how brains are working are also leaving off half the story. So I think that both left-wing and right-wing Solarzians are omitting the other half of the story that Solars would insist is really necessary for understanding what he's doing. Uh, we have a next question from uh, Remis Ramos uh, uh, and then Marco. Okay, so let's let's read first from uh, from Remis. It's in the chat. Uh, when talking about representation, there are al there always seems to be a kind of abstraction involved, especially in conceptual non conceptual distinction. What's the Silurian story about abstraction as a process? Is it inferential? Yeah, this is a nice question. Uh, thank you for this. Um, so I don't know if Sellers has a story about abstraction as a process. I don't even know if he has a story about that. Um, I mean, I think you're right that, and, what, and, even, and I think it's also worth pointing out that representations might even be abstractions even in light of cognitive neuroscience, right? right? There might be a way in which even in light of cognitive neuroscience, representations, to talk, about, talk about representations at all, is still to talk about um, a fairly high level and sort of um, somewhat abstract level of description of your, of your system, right? So for example, if you're, um, if you're thinking about structural representations, right? You might not see those at, you know, what's going on in the brain um, necessarily, but you might think of them as a sort of abstract specification of one aspect of your organism environment system. Um, that's not that, that I, I don't necessarily think that's a problem. I think that abstractions and idealizations play extremely important roles in how science advances. So to say that they are abstractions is not to speak against them, not even with regard to science. Um, ultimately, the, but ultimately the question would be, can they, can they pave, do they in fact pave, do they feed, do they, does time representations in that way, um, does that, does that kind of talk ultimately get vindicated in terms of um, explanatory success for understanding or organismal behavior and 
how organisms uh, learn, adapt, respond, and so on. Uh, one thing that I think we end up, but I, I do think, I, I do want to raise though this, this point, a point about the conceptual and non-conceptual distinction, right? This distinction, at least this distinction is complicated in part because this distinction has one foot in um, traditional a priori armchair epistemology, right? You can read, there's a long tradition of reading the debate between uh, Locke versus Leibniz in those sorts of terms. There's a way of reading conceptualism and non-conceptualism in, say, Kant, Hegel, uh, Husserl, uh, and so on. That's sort of one dimension of that distinction. And another dimension is using that, using that distinction to talk about different levels of subpersonal psychological processing. Um, I do think one has to be very clear if you're using that distinction, whether you're using that distinction in the armchair epistemological sense or in the empirical psychological sense. Those two might line up, but there is certainly no reason to think that they would. Um, now, Sellers does have room for, now Sellers does have room for a distinction along those lines. In fact, Sellers is actually committed to a theory of non-conceptual content. Um, but for him, his commitment, his theory of non-conceptual content comes in through a very weird reading of Kant, right? Where Sellers reads Kant as a philosopher of cognitive science. Right. He reads Kant as, uh, in fact, um, some of you may be familiar with this article um, from a couple of years ago. Um, what is it? The predictive processing paradigm has roots in Kant. You may be familiar with this article. It was in, uh, was in Frontiers in Psychology, I think, a couple of years ago. Um, right. That is, I think, uh, there's also a nice piece by Evan Thompson on the Kantian brain. I think that is very much in the spirit of how Sildorus actually reads Kant, right? He reads Kant as doing a very armchair, transcendental cognitive psychology and invokes a, for Sellers, um, the conceptual and non-conceptual distinction is then used to in part, I think for Sellers, he uses that in order to explain how um, conceptual frameworks are acquired and learned and modified across from generation to generation. So that's all in project, that's all in aid of Sellers' sort of scientific way of thinking about the mind, naturalizing Kant, you might put it. But I don't think I've answered your question. Marco. Thank you. Um, yeah, I like the tangent because um, I've been kind of curious. So, so, so first, a uh, more general question of, of could you um, uh, pinpoint for me what the main motivation is in these directions you're exploring? Is it the philosophical question? Is it pure intrigue about how he tries to bridge the uh, pre-scientific and the scientific or what I'm kind of sensing or maybe projecting is so I have this long standing suspicion that relates to the last points which is you know all this so-called armchair philosophy on of the mind or introspection driven inquiry they all implicitly um, necessitate uh, the ability to systematize the internal experience or model of internal experience uh, in a way that can be universalized such that um, it resonates with others and in that resonance or in that adoption uh, would make them better equipped to both navigate their uh, subpersonal experience as well as communicate or become aware of them. Um, and what do you think of the interpretation of uh, the myth of the given and the myth of uh, Jones as not being driven by deductive logic but by the subpersonal or the affective 
uh, intimation or maybe even confrontation um, with the uh, seemingly paradoxical nature or the seemingly paradoxical epistemic status of perception. Um, yeah, I'm not a philosopher, so for, forgive me if this is uh, offensive to some philosophers, but you know, how, how much are people just hiding? How much is driven by intuition that's thematic and explanation? Um, because for example, the presupposition lists nature of uh, sense data uh, that can also be cast as abductive inference, right? It is a source or a mechanism of generating hypotheses that's, um, you know, abductive inference then uh, after the generative stage needs to be selected. So the, the epistemic status then, or the issue of knowledge dissipates because instead of focusing on truth functions of knowledge, you get more a more participatory sense-making view of what the role is of certain things in a larger inferential process. So then the presupposition simply becomes that sense data is the fundamental source of generating hypotheses or guiding inference. A bit of a incoherent ramble, but, but happy to hear your thoughts on whatever aspect I rambled on. Yeah, so I think there are two, I saw several things going on there, right? And, right, you're sort of, one thing that's happened, I, I, one thing that you said that made me think, so how about this? I read Sellers as being, as representing, as belonging to a particular, very American tradition of scientific humanism. Um, that this is, uh, he belongs to a tradition that includes his father, Roy Wood Sellers, uh, John Dewey, Sidney Hook, Ernst Nagel, um, belongs to this tradition, um, a very American tradition of people who think that what we need to sort of address the cultural and political needs of the current moment is a scientifically informed understanding of what we are as human beings. Um, I think that this scientific humanism has very deep roots in tradition of scientific socialism. I think that there are a lot of people, I think that I, I, I'm ha quite perfectly happy to read uh, Marx and Freud as scientific humanists along with Dewey and, and Sellers and others. Um, I think Sellers has very good personal reasons for concealing his political motivations, given that he was operating during the Cold War, and given that he certainly knew of people who lost their jobs during McCarthyism. So I, working in a different intellectual milieu, am perfectly happy to pick up this strand of Sellers, of Sellers of Scientific Humanism, and make it more explicit and bring this into deeper conversation with Marx and Freud and other philosophers important to critical theory. So I'm quite happy to be up front and say explicitly, the reason why this matters is not just because, you know, it solves some problems in cognitive science, but because it gives us tools we need for addressing the kinds of challenges we face in our current uh, political uh, moment. That's why this matters to me. Thank you. I really like that, if I could follow up. Um... You mentioned Freud, but I'd like to also mention Jung because I actually also did a talk at Clea and that's how I started my talk. Um, mm -hmm. Jung's quote of, uh, we know nothing about the human psyche and we are pitifully unaware of it. Um, so that's why I was asking the question. I, I'm quite glad that you answered as I, as I hoped um, mm -hmm. that this uh, is, is your primary motivation because I fully agree. Something like a science of humanism is absolutely pivotal, um, uh, critical for, for this current age and pretty much all the problems that we're facing are seem to be meta problems or largely um, uh, contingent upon this ignorance of, of our human nature and how we ought to coordinate, collaborate, exist, become together. Um, so, 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 so as a follow-up question, 
do you sense a revival of this? Because I feel like a lot of, I'm not sure how, you're, how much you're aware in your position, but, but uh, I'm relatively online, let's say. And there seems to be a rather, a rather growing movement that I would say is the zeitgeisty uh, millennial cultural manifestation of the seeking of something like uh, scientific humanism. So a key figure there is, I think, for Veiki with the meaning crisis. I'm sure you've heard of it. Um, have um, you? Who is this? John Fervegi from Toronto. So he's a professor of cognitive science and he has become quite a figure. So um, uh, maybe, paradox maybe ironically, uh, Jordan Peterson kind of, I think, uh, united this. So it became ba basically the activation of interest around certain topics that all revolve around how to be, what to be, what our values are, the death of God, et cetera. And then a lot of other figures that, that were able to address these topics or talk about these topics kind of came about. And John Fravik is one of the most important ones because effectively he's doing exactly how you described um, scientific humanism, mm -hmm. where I would say the most important distinct factor is that so far it feels like most people well, I'm not very well read in this, but most people tend to focus on a very fundamental, very fun universal or narrow issue, like the core problem, the biggest thing. But the natural complement to that that seems underexplored is the synthesis of the full variety and diversity of humanism or the human existence. And so mm -hmm. things like altered uh, uh, states of consciousness, um, sense of meaning, mysticism, um, the big uh, diversity in, in cultural um, uh, uh, norms and, and, and uh, stories. Um, mm -hmm. The full diversity can be also approached now, I would say, with something at least scientifically informed, if not science. Um, so it might be interesting for you, since you talked about the social cultural history and the discourse, um, to take that into account. Because it seems mm -hmm. then that the natural question is, what drives this resurgence is it simply the availability of the, the maturity of scientific knowledge that makes humanism addressable from that lens? Or is it that people are deeply experiencing and relevant to the myth of Jones, noticing um, this experience to be the result of the lack of scientific humanism, where the way we are or perceive ourselves or we cooperate together seems to be informed of something completely disconnected from either uh, principled systems or science. Hmm. I mean, look, I'm, I'm enough of, I'm, I'm close enough to the Marxist tradition that I would be inclined to say that the meaning crisis is precipitated by, cap by contemporary forms of capitalism. I wouldn't argue with that, but, but it feels, how, how would that relate to this? Um, that one of the things that, because one of the, you know, to, to go back to, um, you know, Marx's old quip, uh, all the solid melts into air from the minute, um, right? One of the things that happens, one of the things, one of the things that capitalism does is it delegitimizes all forms of authority apart from itself. Mm -hmm. And that delegitimization of authority, particularly of traditional forms of organized religion, um, I think is part of what is precipitating this meaning crisis. Although I have not heard of Verbecki, I need to look at what he says before I could comment anything more and more about, what he, about that particularly. Um, so in, in that regard, right, one of the things I wanna do with scientific humanism is say, you know, a scientifically informed understanding of what we are as human beings um, is going to do a couple of different things, right? Now, one thing it's gonna do and this picks up on, I think, an important part of Silverstone Project, um, is that we want the sciences to be, as it were, incorporated into the life world and not merely confronted as an alien appendage. Right. So I, life I'm worlds? a bit of a, huh? Did you say life worlds? What, I did, What yeah. did you say? So could world. you repeat the last sentence? So, um... No, I just write the name for you. Yeah. Um... Right, but I think that if Sellers wants the sciences to become incorporated into what phenomenologists would call the life world, the Lebensbild. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Um, and a, a scientific humanism would basically do, uh, accomplish that. A scientific humanism 
would not be one that, right? So, I mean, to go back to the point about, you know, what makes Sellers not quite a right wing Solarsian, right? The standard right wing Solarsians, the church ones are being very obvious, very extreme examples of this, will want to say, well, what really amounts to what the scientists tell us, and it's not in the science, is forget about it. That's a very flat reading of the Churchlands. They're much more complicated than that, but that's the standard view about what they're, what they're, on, what they're on about. Um, but that's not at all what Sellers is on about. I think Sellers is much more about um, accomplishing the sort of delicate balancing act where on the one hand, we might need to um, carefully trim away certain supernaturalistic conceptions about, hu about human nature. Uh, we might have to give up on say, contracausal libertarian freedom or give up on um, post-mortem existence. We might have to give up on the idea of the soul as somehow having a postmortem existence after the death of the, of the brain, right? We have to give up on certain things. We have to we have to give up on special creation that there's a difference in of kind between us and other and other animals and, and the rest of life. So we have to give up. We have to, but we can still. But so I was just going to say, we can still. There's still an intelligible core of, you know, privileging art and philosophy and science and beauty and music and truth, nevertheless. And we can use anthropology, neuroscience, sociology, evolution to enrich and deepen that humanistic self-understanding. Mm -hmm. I, I guess my only issue would be or question is 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 whether to take a pragmatic or purely epistemological stance here. If if the main concern is is the uh, the implicit goal of um, uh, scientific humanism, so like you said, uh, capitalism is of course one of the uh, high level causes, but there's a lot of mediating processes there, and one of them is I guess would say you know instead of uh, imposition or authority in a, in a almost metaphysical. Uh, invisible hand sense, you know, there, there's a lot of mechanisms in between that intermediate that are um, implicitly notions of, or signals of authority, signals of credibility. Um, mm -hmm. And the approach of creating the perfect scientific humanist system by itself doesn't, doesn't by itself um, proliferate into the lived experience, into the Lebenswelt. Um, and so, uh, I'd be curious what your take would be on this pragmatic aspect. Like, like instead of the perfect kind of system, what would be the main concerns in ensuring that it integrates, in, that it permeates the Lebenswelt? So one of the, I guess, the political uh, perspectives on, on dealing with uh, the issues of capitalism is parallel structures, right? So, so what would be the parallel structure, the parallel movements, the participatory processes that can uh, invigorate and spread um, a scientific humanism. And again, I really encourage you to check out Jantrafik and the movement around it. I think that is a nice example. Yeah. Scientific humanism is going to need its Jordan Peterson. And that's not going to be me. I don't have the, I don't have the charisma for it. <laughs> um, but it would be have to be something like, I think it would almost be something like that. But yeah, scientific humanism would need to build a a community. Mm -hmm. um, and it would have to, it couldn't just be this sort of ivory tower kind of academic operation. It would need to be something that um, speaks to ordinary, to everyone, um, wherever they are, whatever their background is, whatever they're, wherever they're coming from in their lives. Hmm. Cool. Let me know if you have someone in mind. <laughs> not gonna, be, not gonna be me. That's for sure. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, for I, this question. I already have a job. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Cheers. Herat, do you want to speak? Go ahead. You need to unmute. <laughs> 
Um, <clears throat> thank you very much for your um, contribution. Um, it's a bit outside of my interest and therefore especially interesting. Um, one of the things that you mentioned somewhere in the beginning was the notion of um, categorization. Um, the notion of a category, there are different definitions, of course. Uh, to me, it always means that you put some things, that you select some things, put them together and treat them, treat them as one unit. Uh, to me, um, that seems to be the type of basic uh, manipulation, uh, you might say, of uh, sense data and many other things. So it's categorization seems to be at the basis of the criticism of sellers. And I wonder um, to what extent um, you have been thinking about alternative forms of manipulating different types of things, putting them together in different ways than by treating them as a whole. That's the question, sorry. <laughs> It's a little bit different from the previous ones, but I hope you can help me in this uh, aspect. Uh, thank you for that. That's a very, that's a very rich, very suggestive question, and I appreciate it very much. <laughs> so, one thing I would want to say, as these both as both with, in terms of to speak both as a solar's interpreter and also for myself as a philosopher, um, right, solar's would never, does not object to categorization itself, right? He doesn't know, he, just, he thinks that categories are necessary for mm. having a structured conceptual um, framework. Um, so categories and is not the problem for him. The problem uh. is um, treating categories in abstraction from the process of categorization. Uh -huh. um, that would be the myth of the given because to categorize things is going to be, as you pointed out, selecting, manipulating, a sick grouping, um, and what categories we even have in our conceptual framework might depend on better or worse techniques that we have for categorizing. So as we um, develop better and different techniques for categorizing, our categories themselves are going to shift and change. Um, to deny that that happens would be to affirm the myth of the categorial given. Mm -hmm. And that's what he's against. What do you think about um, manipulating, for example, experience of beauty? Can you categorize? Um, I do think our, I mean, our notion of beauty might change as in all sorts of ways, right? Our experience of beauty might change as a result of um, new forms of art that get invented, mm -hmm. um, um, right? Whether you, you know, if you, whether you find a landscape more beautiful or less because it is, um, has been affected by agriculture might then affect uh, your ecological values in all sorts of ways, right? Um, I mean, there is a sense in which sellers would accept, you know, the old, the good old transcendentals, truth, beauty, and goodness. Mm. Um, I don't think sellers would deny that there are certain things that do transcend all categorical frameworks. Yeah. Um, truth, beauty, and goodness being a monk, being maybe the the you know the the good old platonic trio. <coughs> um, I don't think Sutter's would have to deny that. Hmm. All Sutter's would insist is that we can give at least the possibility 
of giving a scientific, naturalistic explanation for how and why we evolved a sensitivity to truth, beauty, and the good. Mm. Right. So he would not necessarily be against a platonic or neoplatonic view that privileges those categories. He would only be against a version of Neoplatonism that just says, well, they're just truth, beauty, and the good. That's just what there is as transcendentals, and that's just given. And we can't give an explanation for how we evolved as the kinds of beings with those evolved sensitivities to dimensions of our experience that we then have come to classify as the good, the beautiful, and the true. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. That was a nice interaction. Thank you. Do we have anybody else who wants to uh, ask questions or comment? Um, looking at the chat. Not really. mm. We are approaching the the end of of the of the time we we had. Uh, Carol, is there anything else you would like to? Um, um, I have nothing else to add. I think it's been a very productive uh, conversation. I've enjoyed uh, interacting with all of you. Um, and, you know, if you have any further questions or thoughts you'd like to uh, follow up on, um, I can, you know, I'm going to put my email in the chat for you if you don't have it. Um, and um, as Marco and Remis uh, pointed out, I also have uh, an active presence on Twitter, so you can find me there. Anyway, my email is in the chat for anybody who would like to follow up.